So this week we're going to continue to address what we feel is a very important subject out there, <clears throat> fibromyalgia. This is going to be a fibromyalgia update. Last week we, we did uh, about 45 minutes on fibromyalgia, uh, updating a number of uh, observations that we've made relative to the fibromyalgia cases in this clinic and relative to Dr. Gates's research uh, in literature and applying some of those uh, research articles to creating some newer techniques that he, he's using in our treatments for fibromyalgia patients. But um, we're going to do fibromyalgia update part two today because we feel it's that important of a of a topic right now. I'm, I'm Dr. Martin Rutherford. <clears throat> I'm a chiropractor, 36 years, but I'm also a, a functional uh, certified uh, functional medicine doctor. And I am Dr. Randall Gates. I'm a board certified chiropractic neurologist as well as a chiropractor. And for those of you who haven't seen us before, we have melded these two professions. They are two separate professions. Um, board certified uh, chiropractic functional neurologist. I think the field is now called functional neurology. Uh, deals primarily with uh, the, the function of the brain and the nervous system in every aspect. And, uh, and, and um, it seems like the, the functional neurologists cut their teeth on dizziness, vertigo, balance, mm -hmm. uh, concussions. Mm -hmm. but, Very but, much so. But um, we kind of, this practice kind of morphed into a um, chronic pain practice when we started treating, ironically, or maybe not, sorry, fibromyalgia years ago. And uh, we were using primarily the functional uh, neurological uh, methods and then started to realize how important the other aspects of it, uh, other aspects of what caused chronic pain are. We're going to talk about the neurological aspects. And uh, we started to realize that uh, food was indeed a problem, food allergies were a problem, and, and many of the things we're going to talk about today. So we, we melded our two uh, disciplines, and we've, we're getting some fairly consistent successful results with this. So our, our effort here is uh, just to simply try to share with people what we know, whether it's the lay public, whether it's other physicians, or, or um, whoever feels the need to, to, for, to this information. The today, Dr. Gates and I were talking with our producer over here, Kevin. Uh, you know how important the uh, this topic really is because we were talking about um, one of my favorite <laughs> one of my favorite doctors who's on uh, who's on the radio and on television, Dr. Sanjay Gupta. But he had a great article. He does have great stuff on there, but he has a lot of stuff that's inaccurate, so kind of, kind of bugs me a little bit. But he was talking yesterday about. The, the, uh, the abuse of basically heroin in our society, secondary to people becoming addicted to prescription pain meds. Yeah. And the fibromyalgia patients that come in here, I mean, the serious ones are, they're serious. Right. And many of them are on opiate medications. And many of them are on opiate medications when they get here. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Gates wished to continue the fibromyalgia uh, discussion. Because, uh, as he said earlier, we need to find a cure for chronic pain because there's 120 million chronic pain sufferers out there, and it may have something to do why 80% of the world's opiate medications, like hydrocodone, oxycontin, you've heard of these things, um, are consumed in the United States. 80% of them are consumed. And we're only years. like 4 or 5% of the world's population. Of the world's yeah. population. So the rest of the world is not using these medications like we are. Right. And, and I'm not sure the rest of the world is getting fibromyalgia the way that we are. You know, and I'd have to look at those, those statistics, but I wouldn't be surprised by that. Yeah, either. because we have a unique population, and um, uh, that might lead to kind of our next topic of why doesn't one pill fix fibromyalgia. Oh my gosh, because it's such a complex, multi-system disease. So think if you have high cholesterol. You have high cholesterol, you take a pill for high cholesterol, the cholesterol goes down in that example. Fibromyalgia, there are many things that cause someone to have that widespread pain throughout the body. So if you have fibromyalgia out there, if a loved one, a friend 
has it, you know that they have pain all over their body, you know that most likely they've been to their doctor and been screened as being negative for rheumatoid arthritis or lupus or osteoarthritis, those sorts of things, but they have this pain all over their body and we've done other talks on this, this is our third hour long presentation on it. We talk about how fibromyalgia is diagnosed and basically the current clinical criteria are such that you have pain all over your body for more than three months and it's really severe and it's in many different locations. It's not explainable by some other disease or disorder. Right. Right. And with this group of patients who have fibromyalgia, we know that there are many things that are wrong. Last week we presented a lot of very, very new research, scientific studies talking about how the nerves that transmit pain to our brain dysfunction or start to die in fibromyalgia patients. It's from small fiber neuropathy and that's a really it's a landmark finding because before that we thought that nothing was wrong with fibromyalgia patients out here in the muscles or the nerves. Many of you who have fibromyalgia would describe, oh there must be something wrong with my muscles because my muscles hurt so much and they've done a lot of these studies and most of the studies there have been a few that basically showed maybe there's a little decrease in energy in the muscles um, but most of the studies basically said there's really nothing wrong with the muscles. Yeah, well, we never and we never felt that was the yeah. muscles. Right, but a lot of fibro patients feel those muscles because right. that's where they hurt. Right. What the fibromyalgia patient needs to know is yes, now we know that the nerves transmitting pain are involved. We now know that the brain is highly involved in fibromyalgia. In essence, you're feeling more pain in your brain, if that makes sense. In essence your brain isn't shutting off the pain signals coming from your body. Dr. Rutherford has pain signals coming in right now, I have pain signals, but our brain is able to drown those out, kind of like a brake pedal on a car. But in fibromyalgia patients, for a number of reasons, those things start to not work. Also, we know other factors associated with fibromyalgia include autoimmune disorders, things like autoimmune thyroid disease, where the immune system kills the thyroid, commonly termed Hashimoto's thyroiditis, as well as physical abuse. So those are basically the underlying mechanisms behind fibromyalgia. Not physical abuse from your being beaten up and being sore. But right, being, but more. I think that's really an important but, point to yeah. ultimately go. And we are going to talk about that today, too. Okay, because I think that was one of the biggest points missing when I started getting into this. I, there's a, there was a, a, a talk that I gave. It had to be like four years ago. And it's, a, it's still a pretty decent talk. I've reviewed it. And, and, and I say that because so much has happened in four years that if you do a talk or you do a book, it's like obsolete the second that it's yeah. the second that it hits the market, it's obsolete. But I've gone back to look at that talk and still the basic premise is still sound and it's still there. And in the beginning of that talk, to answer the question, why doesn't one pill fix fibromyalgia, the first going to uh, what Dr. Gates just got done talking about, which is it's a dumb name. Fibromyalgia it means pain in your muscle fibers. And as we just discussed, it's not your muscle, <laughs> okay? So that's why, and so a lot of people, you know, is a very frustrating. Those of you who watched any of our stuff know that <clears throat> when this was started, when we started into the alternative chronic pain field, we started with fibromyalgia because I, I had it, and it was something that was interesting to me, and it seemed like it was probably the most complex thing. And when I, in the beginning of that talk, I think I say, you know, I could get the, one of the, one of the things that attracted me to functional medicine was the mantra of treat the patient and not the diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Nowhere does that fit as well right. as here, right. because I also followed up by saying there could be five. I could have ten patients that come here fibromyalgia, and they'll all be slightly different to completely different as what's creating their unique set of symptoms. And then I go on to say there's probably five hundred different things that could be contributing to it. Now, that was just a rhetorical exaggeration, but not by much. <laughs> There's probably 80 things yeah, or, you know, or something yeah. like that that can, that can contribute to you getting the fibromyalgia syndrome, if you will. Um, we still use the term here because people can, can communicate with it. That everybody communicates with the term fibromyalgia, but it's a terrible term. Multi-systems. Mm -hmm. Disease, multi systems. I don't even know if multi systems infectious disease doesn't fit exactly because right. because I would like Dr. Gates. I, I tell you, one of the big lights that came on to me the next the next um, um, or big breakthroughs the next topic that we're going to talk about here was the underlying uh, causes of fibromyalgia, mm -hmm. and I, the biggest thing that got that that was a big wow to me was the stress mechanism, and and then and then. I'm good to go back to what to where I just 
completely diverted from, which was when you said um, abuse. Mm -hmm. and, and, and when I stopped, stepped in, so you didn't mean physical abuse because the biggest shock to me was just after the first month or two of seeing a bunch of fibromyalgia patients was, and I didn't really make the connection at the time, but they were sexually abused, they were physically abused, they were verbally abused, or they went through some <clears throat> severe stress. I had one yesterday um, whose, whose husband died, you know, and then all of a sudden she had fibromyalgia. And that stress mechanism, I think, is maybe the most unappreciated aspect of all this. When I'm doing the consults with, with okay. folks that come in here, okay. they, they, they kind of get it after I'm talking to them for a while. Mm -hmm. And after I start describing the sympathetic response to them and how it can affect their physiology and so forth. But most of them in the beginning don't really get that that's part of what's creating and per created or, sh or triggered and is perpetuating that process. Most people can grasp all the other things you're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, the gluten, the irritable bowel, the leaky gut, but, but the, the stress is, and, and once we, once Dr. Gates started putting together that, our stress modulation program, yeah. we saw huge differences in, in the patient. I mean, I could think back to some patients that we had before that, had we had that program, right. we would have gotten a better response. So. I know what you mean, yeah. You know, I really have to thank Dr. Carrick. Dr. Carrick started chiropractic neurology. Okay. Again, I'm a board-certified chiropractic neurologist. Now this field is being labeled as functional neurology because we look at function of the nervous system. And in our training, even though many doctors practicing functional neurology seem to be focusing more on concussion, maybe more on vertigo. Yeah, that's the hot thing. Migraine do. seems right now because they're a little easier, frankly, than someone with fibromyalgia. Uh, a lot of the training was on pain-based systems which every neurology training you have to go through, but we were really hammered with it and the stress hormones and their impact on pain were just belabored at nauseum. And we went in through so many research studies looking at it. So what that means to you is basically, as Dr. Rutherford is alluding to, is that many of you have been through horrific stresses. I attached an article today where they said upwards of a third of fibromyalgia patients have been abused. Now, we see a little different segment of the fibromyalgia patient population here, in my opinion, just because we have patients who are coming here for natural alternatives uh, to fibromyalgia. And our statistics on those who are abused with fibromyalgia is over 50%. And you know, we very commonly see that it's sexual abuse, unfortunately. And the study that I attached, they said that sexual abuse was 25% of the time. You know, maybe it's just because people have a hard time admitting it because, you know, it's obviously an uncomfortable subject and they probably have blocked it out of their head. And lots of times it would be physical abuse too, but it's really not Sometimes, as Sometimes I'll be doing my part of the exam mm -hmm. and, and then I'll make the comment about their stress mechanism. Mm -hmm. You can tell a person's stressed um, through certain examination findings if you look for them. And then I'll just kind of casually say, um, you know, these are the types of things that cause that, and then they might break down and start crying. By the time we did do the exam, they've already, we've already gone over the history with them, and a lot of times they haven't even put it in the history. Right. That, that we'll see frequently patients will break down while we're, we're examining them and say, well, I, I need to tell you this. I didn't put it down. I didn't, right. That happened yesterday. Or the last two or three times, they say, really? No abuse? And then finally, after the third time, they say, okay, and then they break yeah. down and they go into yeah. it. So, so it's, it's a big deal. It's a, it's a big part of the mechanism that is that, that, that um, triggered and uh, or perpetuated a situation that ultimately was able to develop along with a few other things into your fibromyalgia case. And it's really so important because when somebody's been through a horrific circumstance like that, and sometimes they can be prolonged, their brain starts sending stress signals all the time. As Dr. Rutherford said, basically there are certain physical exam findings that demonstrate the stress response. And in essence, when our levels of stress hormones, namely adrenaline, are increased in the system. That is like fuel on the fire for our pain nerves, right at the level of the spinal cord too. So right where your nerves come into your spinal cord, those stress hormones bind to those nerves and cause them to send more pain signals. So that's why it's really so significant. Yeah. Very analogous to the same thing with autoimmune disorders, such that the immune inflammation causes those pain nerves to do the same thing. And those are really two of the major factors you know, in terms of causes of fibromyalgia. We also talked about small fiber neuropathy last week at nauseum. But the interesting thing is relative to why one pill doesn't work, they've done studies where, 
okay, if we have autoimmune inflammation where the immune system is killing the person, let's give them prednisone. Prednisone decreases inflammation. It's not really that effective. Um, let's give them non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs like Celebrex, or I won't say Celebrex, but let's say just non steroidal anti inflammatories. Most of you are familiar with those. Not effective. The reason why is that by the time somebody has fibromyalgia, their brain has learned pain. And so many other things have fallen apart in their physiology. Such because as of that stress hormone yeah, exactly. for you, all those years. You can shut off the immune inflammation, but that's not going to correct the disorder at that point in terms of those research. And states. it's learned the pain, and it's and if I understand correctly, it's lost its ability in a lot of cases to mm -hmm. to filter. Exactly. Pain. And so the only drugs that really have efficacy for fibromyalgia patients are basically anti depressant like medications. So, you know, SSRIs, SNRIs, which basically mean norepinephrine and serotonin reuptake inhibitors, so they basically cause you to have more good neurotransmitters in your brain. Those help to basically shut off the pain as well as pregabalin, which is Lyrica. Most of you have taken that out there and basically it just dampens your brain down so your brain isn't as excited you don't feel as much pain. Those are the, the most effective treatments medically uh, that are discussed. There may be a few others, but yeah. And, and again, go, riding on the why doesn't one pill fix fibromyalgia, I mean, what we see most of the time, we see a core of, um, we see a core fibromyalgia picture, fibromyalgia picture of the stress mechanism, which is, I'm telling you, I've never seen a fibromyalgia patient who didn't have it. I can't remember the last time we had a fibromyalgia patient who didn't have Hashimoto's thyroiditis. That's very common. probably 90% of the time, 90 very common, or we more. See. And it's all on how you define Hashimoto's too. The, in the literature, the statistics may vary because they're maybe saying for the immune system marker to kill the thyroid, it has to be above X number. Well, and, and yeah. you, we got a whole hour on yeah. that, yeah. so you can you can look you can look, you can look that up. But it's right. usually the stress, and it's usually usually it, almost always the thyroid involved, either Hashimoto's, however they define it, an undiagnosed thyroid, a mismatched thyroid. There's almost always the, you get the adrenal stress from the your adrenals are messed up, so now it's not just the adrenaline going out, but it's the cortisol right. levels, which damages your brain. Now you got short-term memory loss, you got brain fog. So the number of things that can contribute to that, it can affect your lungs. It doesn't seem to be the biggest issue, but it really damages your gut. So most all these folks have gut problems, and then the perpetuation of that. So not the hammer on the stress thing, but that's what we see in fibromyalgia as the core. We see the, the stress the thyroid, the gut, the adrenals, and that can lead into like so like, like 100 different other things. Um, so again, go back to the how does the one pill take care of that? Right. It, it doesn't. Can't. It doesn't. It does, your best shot is what Dr. Gates was talking about, to have any type of relief whatsoever. But um, And it's why it's frustrating for the doctors. The, that's the doctor's arsenal. This is the doctor, this, these are the bullets that are in their, you know, in their arsenal that they give it to you, it doesn't work. The test doesn't show anything. You're then told, well, you know, you got to be pain manager for the rest of your life if you are already sent to a psychiatrist or a psychologist or something like that. So, yeah, I think that probably handles. And that. I think that's a perfect segue into some of the articles that we attach relative to fibromyalgia and IBS. So. Fibromyalgia is commonly associated with things like IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, alternating constipation, diarrhea. Uh, it can be associated with headaches, migraines, interstitial cystitis, uh, depression, a number of, of other comorbidities as they're termed. But relative to IBS, some of the articles that we attached, they were really discussing how fibromyalgia patients may have this thing called small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, which is where you get too many bad bacteria in your gut. Those bacteria can create the bloating sensation after you eat, the constipation, the diarrhea, both, one, in isolation. And then they also talked about the gut-brain axis, where everything you're talking about relative to stress affects the gut significantly. So when you're think about when you used to be a kid and you were going to do something and you were, out and, and you were a little nervous. Maybe. Butterflies in your stomach. Butterflies in your stomach. That butterflies in your stomach is a small version of what Dr. Gates is talking about. Just if you, you know, to give you some example of how the brain actually controls what's going on in your intestines. Because as our favorite author on stress, Robert Sapolsky, talks about, we're meant to be stressed for 20 minutes. We're meant to fight the lion or run from the lion. We're not meant to be stressed out for decades. Exactly, like most of you fibromyalgia patients have been. As a result of that, you can start not sending the right neurological signals to the gastrointestinal tract. You can start sending not enough blood flow to the GI tract so it doesn't heal. 
And then that can make the GI tract more sensitive to pain as well, which is very interesting. So now if you eat your cheeseburger, your cheeseburger feels like you ate a two-foot-long hoagie sandwich rather than just a cheeseburger going through your intestines. A lot of people say, why are we having these things now? Why do we have fibromyalgia? We didn't have it before. But, you know, stress used to be a lot more well-defined than, than it is now. Okay. Prior to, mm -hmm. prior to um, well, mass media, prior to um, two family working families, two, two people working families, the 24-7 deal. I mean, when I was a kid, you know, you worked from Monday to Friday, they had the weekend off, they took Sunday off, they went to church, they didn't go to church, they went to the park, they relaxed. There was a television with three channels on it. You know, you, you had party lines on the telephone where you couldn't even sometimes you couldn't make a phone call because your neighbor was on. I mean, it's, I'm, I make a little bit of light of this, but the bottom line is that even 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 in the in the older days, in the 500 A.D., I mean, people were stressed over staying alive, but they you know they went to sleep at night. They were in their own little community. Stress now is a 24/7 phenomenon. It's you're you're awake. People don't people don't sleep anymore. We you know 125 years ago people went to bed when it got dark and they got up when it got light. Okay, now we stay up until one o'clock in the morning. We watch David Letterman or Jimmy Kimmel or whoever it is, and all these funny guys. Now we get our brains totally fired right. up right. while we're eating junk probably while we're eating it, and and then we don't get in, and then we never get in, into sleep. We never get into a deep sleep cycle. Those of you who are stressed, what we're talking about. If you want to know if you're stressed or not, I will tell you here. Tell you how to know. You don't. You can't get to sleep because your brain's going a million miles an hour. When you wake up a couple hours later, you can't get back to sleep. I mean, that's a stress mechanism. Uh, and and so you have the the cell phones, everything, yeah, everything. And and now we have multiple mass media. Where this day and age, now we're listening to the Ukraine crisis, and we got people cutting people's heads off over there in. in uh, the ISIS thing is as of today. That's the day that we're that we're filming this, and that's and and you got the pictures on the on the internet. Right, yeah. this. People I are mean, stressed out about th this. Is not something that a normal human being is 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 used to be exposed to on a regular basis. Right. And I just uh, the 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 amount of intake to, to the brain today is is overwhelming. So and it's a big point. There are a lot of reasons why this is coming about today. We might get into some more of them relative to food supplies, et cetera. But, and, I, and I don't know if Doug Gates thought that it was going to go this way, but I just think the stress mechanism I agree. is just, yeah, once we started, to, once we realized that the gut was really the entry point, right. that was a huge advance forward because the gut affects your immune system. It affects, you know, it affects everything. It affects your ability to absorb nutrients, it affects your ability to make chemistry that's, that helps your brain to work right and so on and so forth. But this stress mechanism, yeah, once we started to develop some stress modula some non-drug stress modulation programs, I, those were our two biggest step forwards. And those two things, it seems like, screw everything else up. They really do. You know, I was chuckling at myself because it's almost like we all need to stop watching the news and throw away your smartphone. <laughs> Because it's a big issue. I had a, just such a sweet patient two weeks ago, and she was saying exactly what you said. Oh, and ISIS is going on, and you know we have this happening in the world. Oh, and that people take this and, to heart. Yeah, and she was completely stressed out of her mind. And I said, hey, you know, maybe let's tone down the news watching to 20 minutes a day or something. That's fine if you can watch it and not be affected. Right, by but it. if it's affecting you, then but, and you have one of these conditions like fibromyalgia, then yeah, it's an issue. Yeah, a lot of people really worry about it, and and. Whether it's yeah, and we're not saying that not. you shouldn't be worried. If it's affecting your health, then maybe you should look at it. So it's, it's, that's a big factor. Yeah. That is a big underlying factor of fibromyalgia. That, the gut, and, and pretty much everything else we're going to talk about here kind of stems from those things, the autoimmune problem. Yeah, I was just talking with a, a person on Saturday. They had a neuroscience degree, and we just went off for two hours talking about inflammation stemming from the gut. <laughs> and how that's the underlying cause of so many inflammatory chronic disorders in our society, including things like cardiovascular disease and obesity to neurological disorders to chronic pain disorders. And we need to start having these conversations as a healthcare model, as a society, and we because are. people are addicted to the opiates. And, you know, these heroin addicts, they're not just people that you'd associate typically as being heroin addicts. They're right. doctors, they're lawyers, they're firemen, they're ministers. 
because heroin is so much cheaper than these opiate medications. The one thing we didn't talk about, or one thing I didn't talk about relative to the drugs that are commonly used, we went through the, the antidepressants and the Lyrica. Well, if all that fails, then your doctor pretty much only has a couple other bullets in his arsenal, which include these opiate medications, morphine, hydrocodone, hydrocodone oxycontin, oxycontin, Percocet, um, fentanyl patches. And we see it all the time. I mean, it's stunning. We, we see people on these drugs all the time. These are not drugs that right. are supposed to be given out like candy. But that is how our current pain management system is set up as well as insurance. Because nothing up. else is working. Because nothing else is working. Because nothing else is working. So it's not your doctor's fault. It's more right. how it's all set up and how we look at the problem. And you were going to say how much more expensive those things are. Oh, yeah. Them. So they were saying in the CNN article that a, a pill of one of these morphine derivatives is 60 Sixty dollars for a sixty milligram pill, whereas you can get the same uh, equivalent dose of heroin for six dollars. Yeah. So that's and why that was Doctor Gupta's office. Or, uh, yeah. Article. article. So, and in essence, I'll have to give him some credit. For as we were talking about <laughs> with our producer Kevin, you know, you would say, well, how does the doctor become addicted to heroin? How does the the college graduate, uh, really sweet female that I knew, get addicted to heroin? The thing is, is let's say you lose your health insurance. Let's say your insurance changes, so you have a higher deductible, and now yeah. maybe you don't have prescription drug coverage, and now you can't afford your pain medications. And you're looking at, okay, do I spend sixty dollars for a pill, or a pill, One a pill. pill, or do I go do that? That's going to give me the the same effect. For six, I've known two people for six who you would never associate as being heroin addicts who are now heroin addicts. So, anyways, that's just it's like, a problem. It it's is a major a issue. It's it, it, it's your you're involved in, 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 in something that is is larger than even fibromyalgia, so that isn't large enough. Right. You wanted to hit some of the um, updated materials on gluten and yeah. fibro, uh, and we, you kind of already started into, we kind of started a little bit into the gut and irritable bowel syndrome. Um, so, some, new, some new things uh, relative to that that you might be interested in. Dr. Gates is our researcher extraordinaire here, so I'll defer to him on these. Boy, oh boy. So there are articles coming out now about this. We only have an hour. I know. I've got to figure out how to this. We don't have two hours to talk about the neuro. Or the 20 hours that I put into some of those rebuttals. But anyways, one of which I did not send for your recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> but basically, uh, lymphocytic enteritis is something that's being talked about. Basically, it's a gluten condition they're now acknowledging. So basically, the immune system gets fired up to gluten in the GI tract. A lot of these patients have bowel discomfort, but they have other symptoms, pain across their body, overlapping with fibromyalgia, so now there are studies coming out saying fibromyalgia patients, a certain segment of them feel better on a gluten-free diet. There's this whole finding that... And we have seen that consistently. If you look up non-celiac gluten sensitivity, that's basically where you don't have celiac disease, which is an autoimmune disorder where the GI tract gets killed if you eat gluten. But it's where a person doesn't feel well eating gluten and lots of times their symptoms are everything a fibromyalgia patient yeah. describes. Brain fog, pain, problems with memory, depression. And in fact, depression is becoming the most highly associated symptom with non celiac Does anybody ever come in here and not mark off depressed? Right, especially because that's yeah, fibromyalgia. Everybody marks off depressed in the box. And a lot of our colleagues uh, criticize us for maybe giving too much information. If you guys get out so much information, oh, he's ever going to kind of see you're going to tell them how to get fixed. I said, I don't think so. It, took, it takes a little bit of, 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 a, walk, of, a, of a little bit of an investigation to figure out which of the 500 things yeah, exactly. is in that particular case. But the one standard recommendation we have. Yeah. The only and we're not telling you to do this. but for We're not patient. telling you to do this because yeah. you're not our patient, right? right. right. But, but. The only standard recommendation that we make to all fibro patients, and they don't all feel better doing it, but that doesn't mean they shouldn't be off of it. That's another whole subject in itself, is get off the gluten. That's our only, everything else, the other 500 have to be figured out for that person. But, uh, but that's our only standard recommendation. And it's, it, it's it, I will say, most people seem to feel some improvement. Some of you will feel a temporary improvement, some of you feel a huge improvement, and that's diagnostic and it tells a lot about what other things might be going on with you. If you take you get off the gluten and and you don't feel any different, don't think that means you should be on it. Uh, you should be on it. it. It just might mean you have other food allergies or a leaky gut or the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that Dr. Gates just got done talking about. There, there, there can be another. Or if you or if you get off of it, you feel good for six weeks and then you know 
do not go back on it. You definitely should not be on it. There's just other things that need to be checked. But I just thought I'd share that yeah, with you. I think that's good. I think that's great. I guess what we need to say there. Um, drugs for fibro, we pretty much have talked about that. I think we've covered that issue pretty well. I like the one we put, does your doctor even lie? Oh, I missed that one. Oh. So we Because the answer is no, but not because they don't like you. For the same reason, I didn't want to treat fibromyalgia patients after the first couple of months of doing it. I thought, oh my God, what am I getting myself into? <laughs> so I attached an article. It was actually out of Japan, which is really a different demographic than what we have here. And um, But anyways, they were saying how upwards of half the rheumatologists there did not want to see fibromyalgia patients. And it's been discussed in the rheumatology sure. textbooks. I would almost associate maybe even being higher here based on some of the accounts that we hear from patients. But in essence, lots of times they just don't know what to do. Well, I was just going to say, if patients came in here with things that we didn't know what to do every day all day long, how would you feel? Right, exactly. And we're not saying your rheumatologist is stupid. They're incredibly brilliant. But we're just saying for the model of fibromyalgia, they have XYZ drugs that they can give you. And if those don't work, then they can give you these opiates, which we're talking about today. And if those don't work, lots of times the fibromyalgia patient comes in still in pain and still having brain fog and IBS symptoms. And a lot of doctors just throw up their hands. We were talking to that one anesthesiologist friend that, that we work with, and he was just saying, I don't know what to do with them. I was going to say, I'll bet some of those people out there don't think their doctors are incredibly brilliant. Well, I think your doctors <laughs> I, I'll are say incredibly that. brilliant. I think they're brilliant, but the thing your is... Your doctors have to be smart to yeah. get through medical school. They you do. just need to know that it, it's, it's a special cat that can get through medical school and pass those boards and, and so on and so forth. Yeah, most of the times they do but, care, but they But the get, problem is they're in, a, they're in a box now. They're in a box, and lots of the times they have 10 minutes to see you. You have a chief complaint list that's three paragraphs long, meaning your complaints for that day are three paragraphs long, and we walk into these examinations and we talk about it. You know, if I were my OSHA patient, it takes a lot longer for a history than a neuropathy patient. Oh, yeah. Because you have and, and IBS, the two and biggest parts of interstitial cystitis, cystitis, and depression, and and you know gut pain and everything else, and foot pain going on that needs to be investigated fully. And lots of times in the standard insurance model that we have now, your doctor can't do it. So what do they have to do? They have to put you on the drugs. They have to be brief with you. Maybe they seem a little terse with you or short, and you know see you in three months. Yeah, and again, it goes back to the the insurance the insurance model currently, at least, in their diagnostic code, is not kind to fibromyalgia. There's not a silver bullet. We go back all the way back now to why doesn't one pill fix right. fibromyalgia? Well, the current insurance model wants a one pill, one, one exam, one uh, diagnostic study, one pill solution. Yeah, we, for everything. We want a you know, we want a very clean, precise thing that we can be very orderly in how we bill and the amount of time for each patient counter, how much the patient gets to pay, how much the doctor gets paid for that, how much the copay. Well, that doesn't work for chronic pain. Another reason why we have 120 million chronic pain sufferers out there, which fibromyalgia is a fairly significant group. Um, so Yeah, it's a cookbook. Yeah. That's what it is. And most of your doctors would admit it's a it's become a cookbook because that's what the insurance industry will let them do. And on a rare occasion, people say, well, should I go to Mayo Clinic? Sure, go to Mayo Clinic, because they operate outside the cookbook. Yeah. And they're just going to do more diagnostic testing than probably is what typically is allowed. But you'll get more answers. Yeah. But but the treatment protocol isn't going to vary. Usually the treatments are pretty similar. It's going to be pretty similar. Pretty similar. But you'll yeah. just get more data on why you feel so terrible. Right. But you'll get... And maybe the treatments will be different. I mean, we're not trying to argue that. Mayo Clinic is very progressive. They try to be up on the newest of the newest research, which your rheumatologist, he has to be accountable for, you know, 10 different conditions, yeah. 20 different conditions. How can he be up on everything for every condition? It's just not feasible. Whereas at Mayo, they specialize more. So. No, that's true. So, do you want to, so, so the natural discuss treatments. Discuss maybe some of the natural treatments that we've been using that have shown some pretty consistent success with uh, with the fibro patients that we see. So but fibro is a fairly significant part of our practice. I think peripheral is probably the biggest part of our practice. Fibro is definitely second, maybe 20, 25 percent of our practice, yeah. something like that. But we see a lot of fibro patients, a lot. So um, again, just thought we'd share our observations 
um, with you. By the way, you made a comment that we should now start having a, uh, a, a dialogue on the gut and, and all these problems in the medical profession. Mm -hmm. And I put something on your desk yesterday. I don't know if you had a chance to look at it, but it was a, it was a um, advertisement, if you will, full-page advertisement of one of our professional magazines on uh, and Dr. Vasquez was involved. Dr. Vasquez is one of our uh, uh, mentors. He is a chiropractor and a osteopath, and he teaches uh, a lot about uh, inflammation and food and, and crosses with the gut. But there, he's doing a whole symposium on he and two other doctors on on the gut and the GI tract and chronic pain and and uh, to one day seminar for the medical groups. When is it? Well, we already missed it. So. Oh, that one. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. Well. Well, anyways, relative to the fibromyalgia patient, in terms of the causes, as we discussed, it's not one pill is usually not going to fix it. So the causes include the stress mechanisms that we've alluded to, autoimmune inflammation, where the immune system starts attacking the person, or there's just this non-specific immune inflammation, as well as then small fiber neuropathy. And so what we do is we target our approach at basically calming down the immune system. As Dr. Rutherford said, a significant percentage of the immune system is in the gut. So we can potentially manipulate the immune system through changing diet. Let's say if your body is attacking gluten, you can take gluten out of the diet, and now your body is not attacking gluten, and maybe that means the immune response to other tissues of your body that are causing your pain will get calmed down, as an example. But it can be far more complex than that. And so we zero our attention there. That's pretty complex, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And we can zero our attention there. We can also look at other causes of why the immune system is flared up, like viral infections hanging out in the body, bacterial infections. And then we can also look at how do we change the stress response. And that's where Dr. Carrick's work in functional neurology really comes in, in terms of using neuroplasticity-based exercises. That means your brain can change. And we try to retrain the brain out of the stress response. And in doing so, now you have a platform to go back into the brain. Let's say, let's try and change the way the brain is perceiving pain. And we can start at a peripheral level, meaning looking at that the peripheral neuropathy we talked about, where the nerves that carry the pain or dysfunction, we try to reprogram those or shock them back into life via a certain type of therapy to get those nerves functioning better. We call it nerve rehabilitation or neuromodulation. And then we try and do brain-based exercises to start reprogramming the brain out of the pain. And it, my observation is is that, and, and I went through this, okay, and I and, and myself, and my, my observation is is that if, if you're pursuing a therapy, and I'm not knocking anybody out there, we've been here, if you're pursuing a therapy that is not going to address that brain and nervous system, which basically controls your whole body, including your immune system, you know, so, so on and so forth. Um, your chances for a long-term response um, are pretty slim, are pretty slim. You, 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 if you're one of those out there who've tried a lot of things, you know, turn a film, you've got hit a lot of fits and starts, and you got better and came back and got better. Okay. I can assure you this is at least part of the reason why. And handling it with a medication is an entirely different animal than handling it by changing its function and allowing the chemistry of your brain to get better by uh, by eating the things that you're supposed to eat, getting rid of your food allergies, getting rid of the inflammation in the gut, and then that allows Dr. Gates' this ability to work with, the, with literally reprogram, remodulate your, your your nervous system. Um, it's it's we get we get significantly better short-term responses. And um, we don't hear a whole lot from our patients after we're done of them calling back and saying, hey, it came back and, and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And that started more than ever when we started to really introduce the stress modulation mm -hmm. processes. Yeah. He started to introduce them. And so that is fibromyalgia update part two. I think we pretty well summarized it. Yeah, that was a lot. I mean, I mean, we, we kind of have two other, two or three, two or three other presentations online on fibromyalgia, at least two. two big ones, and then we have other little snippets of little natural snippets. treatments for fibromyalgia. And things of that nature. So we're just trying to catch up uh, to people who are interested on, um, on, on the more solid understandings, the newer understandings, 
the opiate situation seems to be a big deal. We see it regularly now in the list of medications that people are taking, and, uh, and, and we just thought it would be worthwhile putting one more, one more piece of data on there for people to investigate. And if you want to see our other presentations, they're on powerhealthtalk.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just go to that site and then just scroll down and put right. there. Or go to YouTube also. That's another medium where you can type in Dr. Martin Rutherford or Dr. Randall Gates, whoever my own show will come in. And, you know, a lot of the research articles we attach today are new since our last broadcast. Yeah, and exactly. the same thing with our broadcast Which means last a week, week ago. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that one and then also the one we did back in Double January or February. Okay. There's so much. And I was reading an article out of December of 2013, and I was just saying, wow, this is so out of date. Because <laughs> they weren't talking about a lot of this stuff. Yeah, five years ago they weren't talking about any of this. Any of this. So that's where it's it's pretty interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah. That's why. So hopefully it gives those of you who have fibromyalgia just know that you know there are methods, there are ways, there are things. It, 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 the situation is evolving. Bits and pieces are coming out here and there. We do our very best to try to accumulate and, and assimilate whatever we can by staying on top of it. And uh, and I think we feel like we're pretty far. We're pretty we're pretty ahead of the curve at this point in time. But the curve is starting to it's starting to rapidly start to become a little bit flatter, and there's a lot more data out there. Um, people are searching, or and, and we get a lot of comments on on a lot of positive comments on what we're doing here. If you have any questions, so if you have any, if you have any comments on what we're doing. You think you have any new data? Please feel free to uh, send it to us. We're always happy to find anything that might help our patients uh, get better a little quicker, maybe stay better a lot longer, uh, those types of things. And if you have any specific questions relative to your particular research or your particular uh, case, or, or, or you have fibromyalgia, you have a question that we haven't covered, and all of that, please feel free to contact us at those two uh, sites and. Uh, I think that should do it for today. So thanks for being interested, and I hope that was informative.